those of you that <laughs> those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Claire Eagle. I'm the new executive director of the TCHA. I've been here just a month, um, and I'm very excited to be here with Ben Rock. So I'll introduce him. Um, and then he'll give his presentation. I believe there's a little bit of time at the end if you have any questions after the presentation. Uh, you heard that process, uh, a little announcement there. So this presentation is being recorded. We do have attendees on Zoom as well. Uh, so if you have to leave early for any reason or want to rewatch it, it'll be available to do so. Great. Uh, so Benjamin L. Ross has been entrusted with analyzing, interpreting, and planning for the future of some of the most important historic sites in the United States, including the homes of Abraham Lincoln and Luther King Jr., a Lafayette native. Ben received bachelor's and master's degrees in architecture with a focus in historic preservation and sustainable design from Ball State University. He worked for the Wabash Valley Trust for Historic Preservation in college and has been a historic preservation specialist with Ratio Architects in Indianapolis for the past 15 years. He specializes in combining research with analysis of the physical fabric of historic buildings to reveal their history and evolution. So with that, pass it along to Ben. Thank you, Claire, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, as I'm guessing most of you own a historic building or want to learn about a particular historic building that you're, you're trying to do research, so where do you start? Uh, most people, if they're lucky, have something to start with. Um, an abstract of title is a very valuable document if, if it came with your property, but not every property comes with one. Uh, if you do have one, it tells you some things, it doesn't tell you everything. Probably doesn't tell you when a building was built, but it tells you when the property was sold, usually how much it sold for, and those can be great clues. Now, when I gave an earlier version of this presentation a number of years ago, I decided to just pick a building as a case study. And this house at 7th Oregon was one that I always thought was an interesting house. It's in, in the Ellsworth Historic District. Uh, so I just thought, let's, let's see what we can find on this one as an example. Now, a great place to start is the Tippecanoe County Interim Report. This was prepared in 1989, and it's part of a statewide survey of historic buildings where basically Two interns drove around every street in Tippecanoe County and photographed every old building they could find and made notes about it. And it was published in 1990. And in this book, you can you can look up either scatter sites or districts. And in this case, the building we're looking for is in the Ellsworth Historic District. It shows up. It has a picture because it's one of the higher rated categories. Uh, and you, we can see what it looked like in 1989 and what it looked like in 20. Uh, 15 or so when that photo was taken. Now, we also have an online way to get some of this information today. Uh, the State Preservation Office has a program called SHARD, uh, two A's, but you can find this map where you can see all these dots, which are all this, the survey data. And so I found the location of that particular house, clicked on it, and it gives me the photos, again, in this case, from the 1989 survey and the notes that were made by the surveyors at that time. Now, they were just going around looking and they said, okay, this house looks like it was built about 1860. That was just a guess, an educated guess. Um, it's also on the map, you can see this hatched area, that's the Elbert Historic District, which is the National Register Historic District. And you can get through Shard, you can get the uh, nomination for the district, which in this case has a map, and then this description of the building and a photograph. So if you're lucky to be in a National Register District, you might have some information uh, like this. Now, again, this was a, this was some of this information was an educated guess by somebody written in the 1980s. Uh, so some of it could be wrong, some of it could be right, but this is a great starting point. Sometimes you're, you're lucky enough to have a walking tour or other reference source. Uh, Historic Centennial has this one that was produced a number of years ago as great information. So there, there are good starting points out there like this. If you are in town, um, in, in Lafayette or West Lafayette, and in, in a few smaller communities, the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps are a wonderful source. So these maps were made to assess the uh, insurance liability of a property and 
really the susceptibility to fire. So the buildings are coated. So, so pink means they're brick, yellow means they're made of wood. Uh, if you see green, it means it's a fire hazard and dangerous. Um, so th these were not uh, recorded with the current uh, use in mind, but they have a ton of information about buildings. And TCHA has all but the 1892 and the 1951 revision, uh, which is incredible to be able to see the originals in person, because uh, most places you're, you're stuck looking at grainy microfilm copies of these maps, and it's very hard to read. You can, you can get some of these maps through the Library of Congress, uh, starting with 1885, but TCHA has 1875 and 1880, which Library of Congress doesn't have. Uh, so that's earlier than most cities have access to. Now, in this, the case of the house at 7th and Oregon, if we look at the 1885 map, uh, it's, it's off the pages. So these are keys, you know, this is page eight. Sorry for those on Zoom, you could see me gesturing. But the red circle shows us the, the block that's not covered. It has a few notes. It says there are 17 frame dwellings, eight brick dwellings, one brick barn, and three frame barns. Um, but if we go to 1892, the next map, it shows this block. And we can see that house on the corner. Um, it, this tells us that it's a brick house. D means dwelling. Uh, the X means that it has a wood shingle roof, which is the most common roofing type in this period. The two in the upper right corner tells us it's a two-story building. Um, the little dotted line around the edge means it has an overhanging roof. And on the back of the lot, we can see there's a brick building with an X through it. That means it's a stable or a barn for uh, probably for horses. And it's got a little yellow part that's a little wood, wood frame uh, addition to it, and then a little brick building attached to it. Now that tells us a lot of information about this house in that time. Now you can compare across the Sanborn maps and you can see changes. So in the case of this particular house, if we look between 1899 and 1907, there's a little front porch that gets added to the house. And then between 1907 and 1915, there's a bigger front porch that's built and a, a side porch is built on the Oregon Street side. Um, so these kind of clues can help you find out when something happened on a building. And again, these are only for cities, but they are very, very valuable. Now, a couple of key things that the Sandmore maps are really helpful with. So in 1899, all of Indiana renumbered addresses and the old systems were not so we have what's now called the decimal system so fifth street 500 sixth street 600 before that they were numbered either sequentially or sometimes they're just bizarre so in this case it went this is uh south street this is where the library is now and these are the row houses across the street so you have 116 118 120 906 122 124 so when they renumbered, it became 620, 622, 624, 620. So it, it became even. Now, occasionally addresses were updated over time, but it, it wouldn't be within that block. It wouldn't be the, the wild address numbers. I, I remember there were some on Ferry Street that went something like 17, 18, 19, 13, 70, 14, 50, 20. So it's, it's very difficult to locate those early addresses unless you have a Sanborn map. And the 1899 map has the old address and the new address together. So that is very, very valuable. And the, the 1899 city directory has a, a note about how the city council was considering renumbering following the statewide system. Also, in 1860, all the north-south streets were numbered. So this is much earlier. But until 1860, the north-south streets all had names. I think third was Ohio, fourth was Illinois. Um, so. If you are looking for that, TCHA has this helpful sheet with the old street names uh, if you're going before 1860. Now, again, maps can be very useful. The Fanmore maps have a lot of detail, but those don't start till 1875. So if you're looking earlier, we do have some good maps that are helpful. They don't necessarily show buildings, but the 1841 map is, is probably the most detailed early map we have showing the city, the, the original plat of Lafayette and the additions to it. And it has notes about when the different additions were laid out. So if you have a building that's on a property in an addition, it was probably built after the land was subdivided into lots. So that can be a clue. Um, in this case, if we look for that house at 6th and Oregon, there are no streets there yet. It's a property that was owned by Henry Ellsworth, who owned a ton of property in the area. 
Uh, he came here after being the commissioner of patents in Washington. The 1854 lithograph is one of our earliest visual views of the city. Um, this is a view from roughly um, between 6th and 7th Street and uh, Kasut Street. And it's, it's not quite to Lingle Terrace, but looking down. So uh, this house is at, the, at where Lingle Avenue starts to go up the hill. Now nah, that house is still there. But this is a helpful view for some buildings you can see. So the Fowler House is right there. And um, it's it's the earliest view like this that we have. And I didn't have a great copy to, to show you here, but TCHA has an original copy uh, that has a lot of detail. The 1863 Burke and Brother map is our earliest map that shows building outlines and property owners. And TCHA has a copy of this. Um, I believe the Shook Agency used to have a copy on display in their office. So this is a very valuable tool because it shows it shows outlines of buildings and it has the property owner. So in the case of the Seventh and Oregon House, it says it's owned by O'Mara and maybe Fogarty or Fobert. Um, and sometimes names are misspelled on these. But that, so that's a clue. We have some names we can look up. The 1866 map is uh, another building outline map and having 1863 and 66 is really helpful because a lot of construction happened at the end of the Civil War and you can compare. But here we have the outline of that house in 1866. So again, we can see it's there. The 1868 bird's eye view is, a, is our earliest uh, quality panoramic view. It's Sort of imagine if you're a bird looking down on the city, uh, and these were this particular one was produced by an artist named Albert Ruger who traveled all over the country and made these views of cities, and they tend to be very accurate. Um, so in this case, we're looking at that at the house at Seventh and Oregon, and roughly this view, uh, but obviously from up high, and you can see even the number of windows on the side of the house is correct. So that can be a, a really great tool. You can view a copy of that on the Library of Congress, but TCHA also has copies of it you can look at. The 1878 Atlas of Tippecanoe County has probably the best map of the city of Lafayette and all of its additions that you can see because it's color coded. And again, if we're looking at that house at 7th and Oregon, we can see all the additions around it. Um, I think it's part of, I think it's 30, 35 and 36 lots of Taylor White Peterson Ellsworth edition. So that, that can be a helpful tool. And then start looking at historic photos. So not every building has individual photos that are available, but sometimes there are views you can see buildings in. So Lafayette Illustrated was a book produced in 1889, has tons of photographs of the city of Lafayette. Uh, a company did these for cities all over the country, but they took a series of views from the courthouse tower, looking basically in a circle around town. And then they took a few from Ford School at 14th and South looking back. So in this case, we can see the back of that house. And if we zoom in, that's the Sanborn map sort of put to that angle. So you can, you can see the roof, you can see the chimneys, you can see that little back wing. And it gives us some clues. So from that same book, this is a view from Ford School looking down South Street Hill. And if we zoom in, you can sort of see the front of the house, but it's not a lot of detail. Um, but it's worth looking because you never know what you might find. Now, oh, and that one didn't come through very well. But if you when you collect all the images that are available of your building, you might start to notice things that have changed over time. Now, in this case, we can't see a whole lot of changes in these views, but um, the sandbar maps gave us the clue that that porch we can see in 1986 and 1989 was built in the early 20th century. Now, city directories are a great resource, especially once you have some names to start with. And Ancestry has some. Uh, they don't. They don't start till 1867, and they have sort of scattered ones. TCHA has all of them from 1858 up until the 2000s. Um, so it's a wonderful source. And the 1863 map had a, the name O'Mara. So if we look in the 1858 directory, the earliest city directory. Uh, it says John O'Mara, um, and he was a dealer in wholesale liquors, number six in Purdue's block, which is on Second Street, still there. Um, and his residence was on Oregon Street. 
Now this early, they don't have addresses. They just say a street or a corner, but that gives an idea maybe he was living on the property in 1858. Um, so that's a good clue. Um, in the case uh, of this property, I had a clue from somebody about this name, Bal or Balfi, and this George Bal, who was a salesman for Peter McCormick. Um, in 1867, his, his residence was on Oregon at the Northeast corner of 7th, which is across the street from this house. So maybe he lived there, maybe not. Sometimes they're wrong. Um, so some it's good to check a few years in a row because if you have a bunch of years where it says he lives on the Northeast corner and then one where it says he lives on the Northwest, the one that's an outlier is probably wrong, but uh, you never know until you check. Now, I also had a clue that the property was associated with the Kimmel family. And I checked and we have uh, John Kimmel who owned a, a prominent bookstore uh, on the square. Um, his residence was 51 South 7th Street, which the Sanborn map show us was the old address of this property. So we can see, okay, he's there in 1885, 1886. You know, all the way to 1891. And again, just checking year by year because sometimes people's jobs change. Uh, sometimes they move. Sometimes you'll find multiple members of the same family living at that address. So these clues can help you start to fill in a story. Now, here looking, all of a sudden by 1899, John Kimmel is living at 706 Highland Avenue. So we, we can see here, okay, he's, he's moved out of that house by this point. And um, in 1927, this is jumping forward a ways, but the 1927 directory is the first one where you can look up by address. In the back, there are pages that are, they're usually tinted in a different color from the regular pages. Uh, I think in this one, they are not, but later on, they are, they're usually pink. And you can look up, okay, 7th Street, South, uh, from South Street, and then it tells you where cross streets hit. So uh, the current address of that property is 124 South 7th. And we can see in 1927, Orwin V. Schaefer was living there. Later on, some of the reverse directories also will include a, an O with a circle around it, which means homeowner. Uh, so that can be helpful. Now I mentioned John Kimmel had a bookstore and this was at the Northwest corner of 4th and Main. And uh, it was there for a long time, books, stationery, wallpaper, other, other uh, paper goods. Um, so you, sometimes you can do some research, again, at the Alameda McCullough Library at TCHA and find some more information about the people who lived in or owned your property. And sometimes you can find biographical information. So John Kimmel is a prominent business person. Uh, he shows up in some trade publications, the American Stationer, a journal for booksellers. Um, he shows up with a, a little biography in there. And there's a photograph in TCHA's collection of his new house in Highland Park under construction about 1898. Um, this, this is looking west on Kasuth Street at Highland Avenue. So this is 9th and Kasuth and Highland. And that house is still there and looks about like that, except it's painted green now. <clears throat> we also have some good resources. Um, again, TCHA has all of these, but the 1888 biographical record and portrait album of Tippecanoe County has a little biography of John Kimmel tells you a little bit about his family. Now, often biographies don't tell you much about a person's house, but sometimes they do. Sometimes it'll have just a note that, you know, so-and-so settled down on the farm and built a house in 1860 or, or something like that. So this kind of information can be very helpful to you. Cemetery records can also be helpful. Uh, TCJ again has access to all these things. You can find out when somebody was born, when they died, where they're buried, where they're buried gives you some clues about them. Um, so in Springvale, most people who were buried there were Protestants in the 19th century. Somebody's buried in St. Boniface, they're most likely Catholic, um, think things like that. Census records are another great source once you have names. So the census is every 10 years. And in this example, we look here in the 1880 census, we have, um, so th this, sometimes they write the street name on the left side. So they're, the census enumerator is going down Oregon Street and this household, it's John Kimmel, he's a book dealer. His wife, Stella is keeping house. Um, his son, Frankie and his daughter, Stella. Um, and, you can't see the top of that, but this, this is the column mark that they are in school at this time because they're children. Um, and actually just below that red line, there's actually, there's a servant named Rosa Burke, looks like Berkeley. 
who's a 19 year old servant living in the house. Uh, the census will often show you that uh, the way we think of a house is not necessarily the, so the concept of the nuclear family is very much a post-World War II idea. And you will often find that you've got a family and some servants and their brother-in-law and some boarders and just, you'll have a ton of people living in some of these houses. And it can be very interesting. And sometimes it might be somebody's young cousin who's moved to the city and gotten a job and they're living with family. So sometimes you find really interesting stories there. Now we can we can look around in different uh, different years and find uh, the same family. Later census forms, so this is 1900, they've already moved to Highland Park, but we can see it's on Highland Avenue. Uh, by the 1900 census, they're putting the house number, so 706 Highland Avenue, John Kimmel, uh, and census has great information. Now, the building itself can also give you clues to its history. And sometimes it's a matter of just standing and looking at it and seeing what, what doesn't look right or what looks like it's changed. And it's a little bit hard to see, but on, um, on the side of this building, if you look below this window, there are very neat straight lines that go down as far as the window next to it, which suggests that it was probably as long as that other window at one time and was modified later to be a smaller window. Also looking for buildings in a similar style or with similar details can give you some clue to when a building was likely built. So there are a lot of these houses that have a similar form with a, a gable that sticks out in the middle. It's two stories, it has, often has a fancier window above the front door. And if we look at the dates of construction of all these houses, they're mostly built between about 1860 and 1880. So that can help you narrow down a window. Also, if you find a specific detail that matches, sometimes that can be a clue. So the, the vent in the, the gable of this house matches one that's on the Fowley House on New York Street, which was built in the 1860s. And it's, it's just a few blocks away. And they're probably made of cast iron. They probably came from the same foundry. So that, that could be a clue that they were built about the same time. Uh, similarly, the, the window hoods, which are made of cast iron, match those on some other buildings. Uh, this in this case. Um, so the Pansera house, the upper one on the left there is on South 2nd Street. It has the same window hoods on the first floor as this house does. And that one has the same window hoods as this house that's on North 5th Street. Um, so just those kind of clues can help you find, if, you know, maybe you might know a date for that house and that can help you figure it out. Now, if you're really lucky, you'll find a view that shows your building directly. Um, these are most common for public buildings, uh, houses owned by wealthy people. So there was a book called A Glimpse of Lafayette published in 1890 that has all these photographs and engravings. And E.P. Knight's house, which later was the Loeb House Bed and Breakfast, uh, is illustrated there. And you can, you can very much see the uh, appearance of the house. Now, if your building is near a public building, you might be lucky. So for example, the, there are a bunch of pictures of Centennial School here. Um, and those these pictures tend to show the edges of houses on either side of it. So your building might not be pictured directly, but you might be able to find it at the edge of a picture of something else nearby. Now, if, if you're lucky enough to find some pictures, you can also track documented changes, just like we did with the Sanborn maps. So this is the, uh, the house that was built by William Barbie that was at 5th and Cincinnati Street, where the YWCA is today. Uh, it was built in the early 1850s at the same time as the Fowler House. And you can see here, so the, the photo on the left was taken in the 1870s, and the one on the right was taken in 1889. So the, it had a cupola on top of the roof in the 1870s. That's gone by 1889. The windows were, I think, uh, six over six or nine over nine panes in the 1870s, and they're one over one in 1889. Um, there's a fountain on the yard by 1889. So you can, you can start to find changes uh, because buildings often evolved over time. And in this case, the Barbie family sold it to the Brockenborough family, and the Brockenboroughs made a bunch of improvements. So that's, that's why the house changed so dramatically. Some buildings change even more. So this was the O.L. Clark house that was on 4th Street between Ferry and North, and it was built in 1834. Uh, and it survived roughly, as you see in the left-hand picture, until the 1890s when it was divided into a duplex, and they actually tore off the front wall of the house and gutted the inside and turned it into a duplex, which survived into the 1960s. Uh, but 
in this case, you know, there, there is not much to, to from the later appearance that would tell me that it was an 1830s federal style house because most of it had been changed. But luckily, we had that picture. Now, also, buildings often lose elements over time. So sometimes you can find out what was missing. So this is the Hiram Chase house at uh, Brown and 8th in the Centennial neighborhood. Now, in this case, we have a photo from the 1950s taken by Mabel Baker, who was a local historian, that shows what it looked like at that time. And she, oh, okay. So Mabel Baker and Herman Berry were two people who took a lot of photos of historic buildings because they were worried about them being lost. And uh, so this is, this is a great example. We can look and see in, in 1955, the cornice had its brackets, you had the attic windows. And by the time I took this picture in the, around 2010, those were all gone. Uh, the bay window is still there, but the upper parts of the windows are boarded over, so they're not uh, arched at the top anymore. And it now has a brick wall that's been built up in front of the windows. Uh, the front porch is now gone. And more recently, the, the front door and door surround were cut out for that, uh, that door that must have come from the hardware store like that. Um, now, some neighborhoods also have some valuable resources. So Historic Centennial Neighborhood put together a website a number of years ago that has information on individual buildings. You can go and click on the address and it'll have whatever information they had at the time. So in this case, um, it has a little bit about Hiram W. Chase um, and talks about the house. Some There's more information for some than others, but if you're lucky, Ninth Street Hill also has a similar website. Uh, so those can be great resources. Now, this is a, an area of, of my personal research, but a lot of buildings were based on books and magazines that were published in the 19th century. And sometimes you'll see things that look very similar on different buildings because they're based on a common source. So in this case, that design on the left appeared in a book published in 1833, and it was used by builders in both Lafayette and Crawfordsville. But, you know, they modified them a little bit, but you can, you can see how these doors and surrounds came from that same source. And so if we think about it, the, the people who were building these buildings were mostly self-taught or learned through an apprenticeship. Um, you know, you say you're a carpenter or a bricklayer, you worked with a master builder, you could call yourself an architect later, you might get some of these books, which would have some architectural details and some notes on how to build a stair or a roof truss or things that are more complicated that you might not learn just in practice and you could improve your designs. Now, we did have some early architects here. Um, this is one of the earliest architectural drawings I know of in Indiana. This is from TCHA's collection. Uh, it was for an annex to the first courthouse on the courthouse square. We're on courthouse number three. Uh, but in 1836, Dyer P. Edmonds did these architectural drawings for this building. Now, architectural drawings rarely survive if they existed. So th these, these are incredibly rare. Uh, but we can often find the sources that some of these architects worked from. So this particular design in William Randlett's book, The Architect, was adapted for at least two houses in Lafayette, um, the Wallace House that survives on State Street at the top of Ninth Street Hill, and Cedar Cottage, which stood at 6th and Columbia and was demolished in the 1890s. Now, the, the best example of this I can show you is the Fowler House, and I've done the most research on this one. but. Uh, the Fowler House was based on a design published in a magazine called The Horticulturist in 1851, and Moses Fowler actually began construction a month after this design was published in the magazine, um, and it's, it's basically a mirror image of the design as published. And the interior woodwork came out of a book published in New York about Gothic architecture applied to modern residences, and you can see very clearly how the craftspeople were using these designs uh, to create really high style buildings out west. And so many years ago, I had found this picture of the Junction Hotel, which stood on Washington Street, uh, sort of near where, where Owen Street goes down the hill, and uh, or I think it's Holloway at that point. Um, but I remember seeing the Reinhardt Baum House in Delphi and thinking, wow, that sure looks like the Junction Hotel that was in Lafayette and was torn down. And then I learned later, well, yes, they're both based on this design by Samuel Sloan that was in a popular architect's pattern book. Now, sometimes they didn't build the whole building. They would just take details from these books and apply them. So the Ramey Milligan House in Crawfordsville has details taken from this book, but the whole house design didn't come from it. And again, sometimes, sometimes you just have a detail. So this house in Richmond has a door that's adapted from this design. 
taken there. So looking through books from around the time your house was built can be helpful. Now, a little bit later, some architects had books that were basically catalogs for their plans. So George Barber is one of the most famous. He was an architect in Tennessee. He had a catalog where you could pick out a house design and you could pay his office to send you drawings for it. They could customize it. So um, the William Krause house that is um, in the in the Perrin district is, uh, it's on Cason Street, is design number 36 from Barber's Cottage Souvenir. And also architects were still using these books months later. So this design appeared in Scientific American in 1891. And the Indianapolis architect Robert Platt Daggett designed this house for Samuel Moore that's on 9th Street Hill. And it's it's almost certainly adapted from that design. He made some changes to it, but that was uh, the source he was working from. So those clues can be a lot of fun. You, you won't find that for every building, but, but it can help. Now, a little more advanced is doing assessment research. And this is hard to do. And in my experience, um, the people at the county office building will tell you it's impossible. Um, and I would say I haven't done this for more than 10 years, so I don't know if it's still set up the same way, but the auditor's office used to have, when you when you'd walk in the door, you come in here, over in that corner, there were a series of rolling shelves with big old ledgers with years on them. And you could open it up and say, okay, I'm looking for a property in Taylor, Hannah Harder, and Stockwell's edition. So you'd find that edition, and then it would have lot one, two, three, four, five, and it would have the owner and the assessed value of the land and the improvements. So the improvements are buildings. Um, or anything on the property. So th these are notes I, I took a number of years ago doing that kind of research where I was just going through and looking up, okay, original plat, lot 81, and who, okay, who owned it in 1863? What was it? Um, so this is a little bit challenging, but in, in the case of this particular one, there were no improvements in 1863, which suggests there were no buildings. And then in 1864, the improvements are valued at $3,000. So that probably means that a building was built between 1863 and 1864. Occasionally, they'll even make a note on there that says New Brick House built July 1875, uh, because the point was assessing the value for tax purposes. So they documented it. Um, but again, in my experience, the employees at the auditor's office always told me, oh, no, you'll never find anything in those books. There's no way to look it up. Um, but it, it, it was possible, and then it may still be there. Uh, this is a, a more modern way to put it into a spreadsheet with that kind of information. But the one caution with assessment research is the economy in the 19th century was very volatile. Um, I think we have all lived in a period where we had some economic controls that were put in after the Great Depression. In so they constantly were having what were called financial panics, what we would call them recessions today. So in 1837, all of a sudden, it seems like everybody's property gets really valuable, but that's because they had terrible inflation after the panic of 1836. So um, in a lot of properties in Lafayette, 1858, you have a big spike because there was a bunch of inflation after the panic of 1857. So it's helpful to look at some of the other properties around yours if you're doing that kind of research just to calibrate it a little bit because uh, for a long time, everybody thought everything in town was built in 1858 because all the property values jumped so much, but it really was just inflation. Uh, so assessment research can be challenging, but it can be very, very rewarding if it gives you a clue. Uh, in, the, in the particular example I showed here, this uh, property we researched, it, it turned out the assessment value didn't tell us much. It just told us the property remained constant over time. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, when you're doing research, you'll find a lot of claims, especially if your building was a famous building in the community. And I feel like a lot of my job is telling people that the story that's that's really fun or really cute is not true. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've talked to so many people that say they have the first two-story house built in Indiana or the oldest brick building west of the Alleghenies or the, the first building in town that had electricity. Now, it's possible. Uh, you know, if you if you have a house that was owned by William Wallace, who owned the largest plumbing company in the city, then it's very possible that he had some of the first running water systems in the city. But if it's just a regular building, it may not be true. Um, so always take those kind of claims with a grain of salt. Anything written before the 1980s that talks about architectural style is often suspect because the terms we use today for historic styles weren't really formalized until that time. So everything gets lumped into these big categories like colonial or Victorian, and those don't really mean anything or they're they're so broad, they don't tell you a lot. Um, 
lots of people ask me about Underground Railroad. Um, so this is this one's challenging. I would say usually the answer is no, but um, you know, was your building built before 1865? If it wasn't built before 1865, there were no enslaved people to escape from enslavement in, in the sense of the Underground Railroad. Um, did the owners have any documented connections to abolitionists or people who were known to be involved in the Underground Railroad? And especially were they Quakers or members of the Religious Society of Friends? Because the Underground Railroad was an illegal network of people who were violating federal and state law because of their beliefs. And the Quakers were some of the only people who were radical enough to do that. There were a few other people. Uh, the Fowley family were a few, or one of the, the few examples I know of in the community here who were not Quakers who were involved in this. But in general, most people were not radical enough to violate the law. Um, so that's a big clue. But if you're in a community of Quakers, like out, out towards Shadeland, there's definitely documentation of that kind of stuff happening. Um, now, again, physical features. So I've, I've seen so many of these where people say, well, my, my house has a closet, or it has a trap door to the cellar, or it has a well, or you know, all of these things are relatively normal features of buildings. So it doesn't mean it's a secret. And the Underground Railroad was really a network of people. So you might have hidden somebody in the attic or put them, you know, had them go hide behind something in the bedroom if somebody was coming around, but it wasn't necessarily secret underground chambers. And people get really fixated on that idea that it has to be a hole in the ground with a trap door. And that's just not true. Now, I'm going to open up to questions because I'm guessing you all have questions. This was just an, an introductory overview. So what, what, are you, what are your questions or what are you looking for or what challenges have you run into? Yeah. How far the records go? Uh, the land records go back to the 1820s, with their, the earliest records. Um, it's difficult to document anything on buildings here, I would say, before the 1840s, but we have some information. And then, if I could come here and try to do research, but I just be on my own, or could I ask questions of someone? Is someone here all the time? Uh, there are there are people at the library, and I don't know, Amy, if you want to speak to that, since you are. So, so to say, one to five, and Friday from ten to four, and by appointment. And by library at ten, it's called the Ardenbright Genealogy Center. The Fowler House. Next yep. to the Fowler House, the Red Mid-Century Building. It's at ten and six. So call or. Email and set up an appointment. Okay. And they have wonderful resources there that many communities don't have. The vertical files, um, this, you can look up by community or by street, and there might be information on a building in there. Uh, there are files by family. There are lots of legal documents there that, that may have clues. Um, it can, it can be really good for you to learn about a property if somebody who owned it in the past died and went bankrupt because it means their uh, their possessions would be inventoried and auctioned off. And sometimes it'll have give a lot of information about the property. Um, I found it, examples where it goes room by room, okay, front bedroom, and it has this, this, and this in it, and it has a blue carpet. And it says it had this many pairs of curtains, and you can, you can almost walk through a building that way. Most of the time you don't find that, but sometimes those resources are very helpful. And all that's at TCHA. Phone books and city directories, don't exist in the digital age. Mm. Is there a comparable resource <clears throat> that um, those have become that are available or that that uh, researchers would look to today to replicate that kind of knowledge from 50 years ago? No, we don't have anything quite like that. And the census is also not as detailed as it was. Um, we do have property records. So the, the county's GIS records of property transfers are available, but you can't do anything like you could do with these. You know, in, in, until about 2000, you could look up by address, okay, who lived there, what was their job, and all that. And there's there's no good source for that today other than Google or social media or newspaper notices. And those are dynamic. The Google's dynamic. Yep. So it, does it disappears over time. It is a challenge for researchers. Oh. So, Doc, you, you're showing more stuff in Lafayette. Is, yeah. The further out of the city limits, does it get tougher to do the research? It can be, yeah. 
it, you know, on a rural property, you're less likely to have you know pictures that show show it from another property. Um, but some properties are documented, and um, it just depends. And it's it's worth going to see what's available. But it, I would say there there is much more information available if you're in a city or a town. Jeff, uh, we have a question from the online viewer of how much time commitment did it take for the case study that you featured? How long of a process was it? That one, it was a for me that was a couple of hours and it was tagged onto other research I was doing. So I would say you you can find a lot in, in it depends on how much you're gonna put into it uh, and how challenging your property is. But I mean, you could research a building for weeks if you wanted to, but I would say you can, you can probably find a lot in a starting visit and do a little bit here and there, or you could focus on it for a little while, but it just depends on how far you wanna go. Michael. A comment. Then you, you mentioned the abstracts for the uh, or the you know, properties. I found that to be immensely helpful in determining the approximate time when my house was built because I had the abstract. Here was uh, the land purchased uh, this year. I think it was four hundred dollars. And this is in Centennial neighborhood, and seven years later, it sold for seven thousand. Mm -hmm. Wow! What happened back, yeah. back there? I would imagine he built the house early, not the latter part. Of so then, my guess was okay, the house is circa eighteen forty-six, and with its style and so forth, it all jived. Yeah, and and that's where an abstract can be very helpful. So one example of a property I researched recently in Madison, Indiana, property we knew it was purchased in November 1818 by the original owner. And for, for 100 years, people said this house was built in 1818. And more recently, we were able to do dendrochronology. So it's basically you, you take a core out of the framing timbers of the building, if it has the log all the way to where the bark was, and they can tell you what year the tree was cut down, because that's where the rings end. And we found so the property was purchased in 1818. The trees that were cut down for the framing were cut down in 1820 and 1822. So we know that the house was probably built between 1820 and 1822, but it wasn't there in 1818. So often people built things soon after they, they bought the property, not always, but often. Um, so that can be a clue. Some properties have had multiple buildings on them. So for example, this property we're on here, probably had buildings on it from the 1820s. In the 1840s, it was owned by John L. Reynolds, who built a big brick house that was, was here. Later, it became the Lincoln Club, then it became the Eagles, then the, the Masons bought it, then they tore down the house and cut down the hill and built this building. So there have been a, a lot of things on this particular property. So if you have a property, especially one that's, that's in the core of Lafayette, or on a, a farm property that has been occupied for a long period of time, there might be multiple generations of buildings on that property. So it, it's possible that something was there, was torn down or burned down and something new was built. Uh, so that can be a, another clue. Yes. Just out of curiosity, um, we have some of Mabel Baker's stuff. Did all of her photos go then to CCAK? They have a collection of her slides, at least. Slides. Um, I don't think it has all the photos that were in her newspaper articles. Um, so I don't know what happened to all of those, but she provided such incredibly valuable early research on a lot of buildings in Lafayette. Um, she, she's one of one of our early heroes. We do have a collection, a vertical file collection of her articles. Oh, okay. Yes. And to view this, the other just so much information to review online. What's the, the way to get the, to, to view it online again? All that information you just told about oh, um, research. Th this, I think this will be available. TCJ will make this available after the presentation. Yeah, put it on our YouTube channel. Okay. The library YouTube channel. Yeah. TCJ YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question. So we're talking kind of as, as, as we're curious about our homes here, but can you tell us how you use this research in your career? Sure. Um, so I work with a lot of museums and historic sites, including the National Park Service, 
Uh, so the project I mentioned, the house built in 1818, is a museum in Madison, Indiana, the Sullivan House. It, it's a significant early building. It's been a museum since the 1960s. And Historic Madison Incorporated wanted to know, okay, what, what part of this building is actually original? Which parts of it were restored in the 1920s or in the 1960s? And what did it look like? How did it change? So we did a lot of in-depth analysis. And this will guide their future treatment of that museum to tell a whole bunch of stories that are in the building, but that were not shown through the interpretation that was created in the 1960s. Uh, another example, so the Martin Luther King Jr.'s house that I was fortunate to analyze for the National Park Service. So in 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King bought a house after much debate because he was concerned that owning property would cut him off from the, the struggle of the poor. So they compromised. They said, okay, we'll move into a, a neighborhood where there's a lot of need. So they bought an older house and had it remodeled. And one of the questions when the National Park Service acquired it was, well, what was the history of this building before? What did it look like before the Kings expanded it? And we determined it was a house built in the early 1930s by the principal of uh, one of Atlanta's Black High Schools, who was a, a prominent community member. And it was uh, connected in design to a number of other cottages built in the city at that time. And seeing how it was updated by the Kings in 1964-65 also says a lot about how family life changed from the 1930s to the 1960s. The original house had this little kitchen that was sort of cut off from the rest of the house. And then in the 1960s, the Kings were a modern family with young kids. So they opened up the kitchen and put it in, it's very similar to my, my grandparents' house that was near Jeff High School that had sort of a, an, a peninsula counter between the kitchen and the dining room. So you could keep an eye on the kids while you're making supper. And, and they had a, a family rec room in the basement. And so th those kind of things helped us tell a fuller story of, of what the building's relationship was to the people who lived in it and how it reflected their life. Yes. Could you tell us what you did with Abraham Lincoln's home? Yes. So uh, I prepared a historic structure report as part of a larger team. So we analyzed the whole history of the building and about 50 years of other people's analysis to figure out, okay, what, what was the evolution of the house? What did it look like at different time periods? How has it changed? Um, so that that house was built as a as a one story cottage in 1839 by uh, an Episcopal minister named Henry Dresser, and in 1844 he sold it to the Lincolns. And then the Lincolns added onto the back of it. They needed a little more space. And then in the 1850s they actually cut off the roof and built a second floor on top of the house and partitioned some rooms. And they had more money by that point. They needed some better space. They needed a dining room so people weren't eating in their kitchen. And the evolution of the building helps helps us tell that story. But we had to figure out, you know, when did this happen? Did they do this in this time or this time? Or was it somebody who changed after the Lincolns? Um, so that document, is it's in final production right now. It's about 600 pages of information, history, and photo, lots of photos, lots of drawings. It's in Springfield? It's in Springfield, yes. Yes. How much does foundation come in play on, the, on your research? So the foundation of the building? Yes. It it can be a it can be a big clue because the way foundations are built changed quite a bit over time. So if it's a dry laid stone foundation, it's often relatively yeah. Good. yeah. Okay. That 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 could be a, a, a big clue. Uh, if it's if it's round field stones laid in cement mortar, it's probably early 20th century. But if it's the sort of the rough limestone, relatively flat pieces or squarish pieces, often okay, big pieces. Yeah. Okay. Um, that can be a, a good clue. The the materials too. So so brick changes a lot in that period. Uh, so the earliest brick is made of local clay. It's very it's relatively soft, it's sort of a pink or orange color. Some people call it pumpkin brick. Um, and then by about the 1880s, you start getting modern machine pressed brick that tends to be darker and red and sort of sharp edges and very hard. And in the 20th century. Brick tends to get textured and you get brown and different colors, uh, sort of buff colors, yellow. So materials can be can be a big clue to the age of the building. I want to see pumpkin brick is that's what my foundation. <laughs> Ours is all rock. Okay. And if any of you have pictures of a building and I'm happy to look at them real quick at the end here because I might be able to give you a guess about something. Any last questions? 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. <laughs>